thank you very much. I'm very delighted to be uh, back at uh, back at Berkeley again. Uh, place has hardly changed. Uh, so today I am going to talk about the quantum information theory of the gravitational anomaly, some recent work um, uh, based on a paper with uh, Domenico Orlando and Masataka Watanabe earlier this year, and actually also <clears throat> rather heavily based on uh, Masataka Watanabe's master's thesis from 2015. So, okay, uh, quantum information theory. Ah. It's interesting, uh, really, really interesting, isn't it? Hmm? Hmm? Well, I mean, <laughs> come on, it just is, right? Hmm? Because it's all about the general, uh, General properties of <coughs> uh, of Hilbert spaces and tensor factorizations, which means it all just reduces to linear algebra, which we all know is fun and exciting. Which means quantum information theory, logically speaking, must be fun and exciting too. You have to admit it. Okay, well, fine. Maybe it isn't. Mostly it isn't. Uh, granted, you win. But okay, uh, here we are. This is a talk about quantum information theory. We have an hour together. Uh, so we might as well find something interesting to say about it. And what could be more interesting than something counterintuitive about entanglement? Hmm? Something iconoclastic something shocking that will scandalize and horrify you. Well, how about this? Entanglement doesn't exist. It is not a thing. It is to choose the politest possible word, nonsense. Oh, thought I had the polite version of the talk. Okay, anyway, anyway. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> okay, well, I don't want to shock and scandalize you too much. So let me qualify that statement just a bit. Uh, I don't want to say entanglement is always nonsense, uh, just that it's usually nonsense. Or to say what I'm going to tell you a little bit more quantitative Quantitatively, entanglement is generically nonsense in the sense that, uh, well, what I'm going to tell you uh, is that there is a particular obstruction in local quantum field theory that renders <clears throat> the usual notion of entanglement between spatial regions intrinsically ill-defined in a sense that is both formally precise and physically consequential. Uh, and that obstruction sometimes vanishes, but in even dimensions, it's generically non-vanishing, and the obstruction is given by the familiar gravitational anomaly. Uh, so we're going to show that the existence, uh, that the non-zero gravitational anomaly leads to, uh, leads to uh, no definition, no uh, consistent definition of entanglement in, in local quantum field theory. And I want to emphasize that when I say there's no definition of entanglement in the theory, I don't mean that entanglement between regions vanishes or something. Uh, I mean that the mathematical concept of entanglement between regions of space is intrinsically ill-defined in theories with certain gravitational anomalies. And uh, so I'm going to focus on two dimensions. It's by far the simplest case to understand directly. Similar statements can be derived for higher even dimensions. But in fact, the way to derive them, or the easiest way to derive them, is by relating to two dimensions by, uh, by descent and dimensional reduction. So, so really, uh, the two-dimensional story is the, is the important part of the story. So 
I also want to emphasize that nobody's questioning the basic concepts of linear algebra here. Of course, in any separable Hilbert space, you can always write a basis and tensor factorize the basis into factors. Uh, I'm only telling you that those tensor factors can't be thought of as representing Hilbert spaces living in complementary regions of a spatial slice. Um, so that is, if the spatial slice is uh, uh, the union of, of regions A and B, then we do not have a tensor factorization of the full Hilbert space uh, of the form uh, Hilbert space on A tensor Hilbert space on B. Um, so, and by the way, you know, many of you probably, uh, well, let, let me, let me get to that. Okay. Um, so I, I want to emphasize that, uh, the obstruction to entanglement I'm discussing here is not related to the obstruction to factorization occurring in gauge theories, having to do with the fact that, uh, matter lives on vertices and, uh, gauge fields live on links and so on. Uh, that's a short distance obstruction to tensor factorization having to do with, you know, short distance physics near the entangling surface. So the obstruction I'm going to talk about today is really a long distance obstruction visible in the infrared. And it has nothing to do with, uh, you know, UV divergences near the, uh, near the entangling surface, which, uh, you know, that's, that's sort of a well, well studied subject still a lot of interesting things about it but it's 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 really a separate issue from from what's going on Simeon? Uh, yeah a quick question i'm uh i'm sure you also don't mean that but I, I would have thought before we even get to gauge fields you would have agreed with me that there's an obstruction from the fact that in quantum field theory it's a type 3 von neumann algebra and you just can't factorize the hilbert space that's right yeah so so it, it and i i that's the thing i was about to say and then i thought well okay well I'll, I'll i'll defer that but yeah no it's 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 really it's really a separate issue from that those are those are both um really uh, short distance short distance issues i mean as you know in 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 non-chiral theories um that obstruction is sort of you know not not very physically meaningful it can be removed by regularization and renormalization in ways that are have been studied quite a lot in the literature. So the, the, the point is in theories with certain kinds of anomalies, um, th those, those obstructions cannot be removed by regularization and renormalization. Any regularization process uh, that preserves the, the locality of the, op of the operator algebra um, uh, fails in, 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 uh, in cases where the anomaly is present. So, um, yeah, so, 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 uh, you know, I, I, I didn't actually talk about, uh, about the formal algebraic quantum field theory issues, Th those are interesting, and they've been studied, uh, you know, they've been studied a bit, um, and I think they, they've been studied not in a way that, that, uh, uh, connect in any well understood way with our, with our conventional notions of the anomaly, but the results are consistent with uh, with what uh, what we're talking about here, but yeah, I mean, I think I think the sort of uh, the issues to do with uh, whatever um, you know, relative entropy and uh, Araki's construction and so on would be interesting to understand in the context of of, of anomalous theories. And, and that, as I said, it's been looked at a little bit, but uh, that's I, I'm not going to be talking about that too much. But someone should should do it. Um, yeah, so anyway, well, when I say that entanglement and uh, intensive factorizations don't exist, I really mean in that sense. So I'm, I'm going to show you that uh, the existence of, of the anomaly implies, uh, of a non-zero anomaly implies non-factorization, or the logically equivalent contrapositive uh, existence of a, of a tensor factorization, you know, mod modulo UV issues and so on uh, it implies the vanishing uh, implies the vanishing of the anomaly. Um, so it's this latter form that's related to more familiar concepts and is easier to prove. Uh, so now you've all been remarkably restrained up to this point actually not not Raphael, but that's fine. Uh, most of you should be jumping out of your seats by now and shouting at me that my ideas are wrong and I'm stupid and I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> 
Um, so in particular, you should be wanting to tell me that, of course, the Hilbert space tensor factorizes because you can always see that by putting the system on a spatial lattice where tensor factorization is manifest. But let's examine that idea a little more closely. Um, so we'll see that when the gravitational anomaly is non-vanishing, then a lattice regulator never exists. And I should mention that all the no-go theorems uh, in this section originally appeared in, in Masataka Watanabe's master's thesis uh, and various, various uh, uh, seminars and conference talks and so on. Uh, after the original appearance of these results, sometimes many years later, uh, various uh, follow-ups uh, uh, appeared uh, in the literature. Um, but uh, just to be completely clear, the correct original reference uh, for these results is uh, Watanabe's thesis in 2015. Um, so anyway, in, in, field, in free field theory, uh, the connection between the anomaly and the existence or non-existence of lattice regulators is an old story going back to the early days of lattice gauge theory in the 80s. So 35 years ago, Nilsson and Ninami approved various no-go theorems for chiral fermions on the lattice, and the two-dimensional version is simplest of all. So let me review the old-fashioned proof of the Nielsen and Ninami theorem uh, for, for uh, uh, two dimension, free chiral fermions in two dimensions. The proof goes as follows. Uh, suppose you have a, a system of fermions on the lattice satisfying canonical commutation relations. Uh, where little i and little j label the lattice sites and big A and B uh, is an internal label on the fermions. Then consider the most general free Hamiltonian satisfying a bounded nearest neighbor property, which is to say a Hamiltonian that's quadratic in fermions and links fermions that are a bounded number of lattice sites apart. Um, so this this uh, kernel F in the, in the middle uh, uh, is, is symmetrized and anti-symmetrized to make the Hamiltonian uh, Hermitian, and then uh, uh, vanishes when i minus j is greater than some some fixed number of lattice sites. Um, so if you Fourier uh, transform the fields, uh, you find that the the Hamiltonian is is diagonal in diagonal and quasi momentum uh, alpha, um, and it depends polynomially on the, on the exponential uh, e to the i alpha. And the important point here is that uh, the quasi-momenta alpha take values in a circle rather than a real line because space has been discretized. And for any value of alpha, the frequency spectrum of the fermions is given by a set of eigenvalues uh, of the matrix uh, MAB. So the modes that survive in the infrared are those in neighborhoods of alpha space where one of the eigenvalues uh, has a zero uh, and the velocity of each mode in the infrared is just d omega by d alpha. And, and since the eigenvalues are just real periodic functions of the block parameter, uh, each eigenvalue that crosses zero from negative to positive must later cross zero from positive to negative. So there are always exactly as many left moving massless fermion modes as right moving massless fermion modes. And it's impossible to get a uh, relativistic fermion theory in the infrared with c left not equal to c right. So this is kind of the uh, old-fashioned proof of the nielsen nimiya theorem in two dimensions. Um, it applies only to free fermion theories, and even for those theories, it's a bit technical. Um, so in particular, you have to Fourier transform, and once you go to Fourier space, it sort of lose any nice clear picture in real space. So uh, let me give you a new proof of a, of a vastly generalized version of the theorem with a different character uh, using the arena of real space and applying to all interacting theories as well as free theories. So the structure of the proof is as follows. So consider an arbitrary CFT in two dimensions and suppose it has a lattice regulator. So from the lattice regulator for the CFT with bounded nearest neighbor interactions of any kind, we can construct a boundary condition for the CFT. Uh, the Hamiltonian in the bulk of the space flows to the original conformal Hamiltonian, and the boundary condition is not necessarily conformal, but viewed on sufficiently long distances, it should flow to one. Uh, then the conformal boundary condition you obtain is unitary and energy conserving by construction, but it's easy uh, to show that conformal field theories can only admit such consistent boundary conditions uh, when they have equal left and right moving central charges. So it follows that the 
only conformal boundary, uh, the only conformal field theories with lattice regulators are those with vanishing gravitational anomaly, uh, C left, uh, C left equals C right. So for a free massless fermion theory, of course, the central charges are just one half uh, number of left and right moving fermions. So this proof implies the usual nilsson nimia theorem in two dimensions as an immediate consequence. But this proof is kind of more general. And I think it's more interesting because it applies to any interacting conformal field theory in two dimensions. So schematically, uh, you can write lattice regulator, existence of a lattice regulator implies the existence of a boundary condition implies C left equals C right. Now, so let me just flesh out the individual steps that was kind of schematic. Uh, uh, so first, why does the existence of a lattice regulator for a CFT imply the existence of a boundary condition for that CFT? Oh, but, Yeah. I can ask one thing. Uh, let's let's think of you're focusing on two dimension. I understand, but let's 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 go to four dimension. And yeah. and Nielsen Ninomia theorem, if I remember, prohibit lattice regularization for chiral gauge theories. Say standard model. That's right. Which, yeah, no, which it's, does it's, not it's, have uh, uh, which does not have a gravitational anomaly. So your well, the, your result is not equivalent. The, there's it, no such a, there's no such thing as a pure gravitational anomaly in four dimensions at all. Oh, you, you're well, ignoring short distance gauge and separation and any of those issues. No, 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 no. CR equals CR. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, no, in four, in four dimensions, there's no, there are, look, there are interesting implications in even involving global symmetries in four dimensions, but, but the, the, the proof is there. The proof is different dimension by dimension because the, 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 the result is different dimension by dimension because the types of anomalies that exist are different dimension by dimension. So it's, it, it, the discussion isn't really sort of uniform dimension by dimension. Um, I, I, can, I can discuss what, what are the implications in, in other dimensions towards the end. I, I have like a slide or half a slide about it, but uh, we can discuss it more. But I think it, it's all, all the results about other dimensions are most easily understood by, by uh, dimensional reduction and descent. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Down, down yeah. to 2D. So okay. I think it, it, it's easier okay. to just consider okay. the 2D. But not 2D. in this sense, that's what you're saying. Like left and right, C, C left is different from C right. Well, there's there's no C left and C right in four dimensions. Yeah, so so not in in this sense you're talking about. In that case, you have to analyze a dimension reduction, but not dimension reduction and reduce to the argument you're doing right now. It's not. Let's let, uh, this this is all about two dimensions. Let's let's talk about four dimensions okay. Okay. towards the end uh, yeah. because there are quite interesting implications, including for uh, quantum information and, and holography and so on. But but uh, yeah, let's 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 defer that. Then it's fine. It's everything's clear. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, so the construction in two dimensions is very simple um, of the of a boundary condition starting from a lattice regulator. It's just what we call free boundary conditions. So start with a lattice Hamiltonian and just delete all degrees of freedom at negative lattice sites, and that's it. So at long distances, uh, compared to the lattice scale, you have a continuum theory whose spatial slice is a half line uh, R plus rather than a full real line R. And so we've assumed that the, that the lattice regulator had the bounded nearest neighbor property. Uh, so the lattice Hamiltonian is unaffected by the deletions after some fixed number of lattice spacings to the right of the boundary. So it follows that the bulk Hamiltonian density flows at long distance to the same bulk Hamiltonian density as the CFT on the full real line, uh, and only the boundary Hamiltonian is unknown. Now second, uh, why does this uh, why does this necessarily give a conformal boundary condition? So that's a subtler question, uh, and and there is there is an assumption uh, that goes into it, a, a technical uh, uh, assumption which I think is not generally proved yet in in uh, quantum field theory. Uh, so certainly one doesn't start out with a conformal boundary condition, and there's no guarantee uh, that the boundary condition even becomes conformal by the scale. The same scale at which the bulk Hamiltonian uh, has flowed to its conformal point. Let's call that lambda CFT. So at that scale, the boundary Hamiltonian may still contain non-conformal operators with large coefficients in units of lambda CFT. Uh, 
So if the non-conformal operators in the boundary Hamiltonian are all irrelevant, then we expect they flow to zero at sufficiently long distances and the boundary Hamiltonian flows to a conformal boundary condition. Um, if on the other hand, there are relevant operators in the boundary Hamiltonian, uh, we expect that they give large frequencies to some boundary degrees of freedom, which can then be integrated out, uh, leaving us with a boundary condition with fewer degrees of freedom. So eventually one expects the process uh, terminates when we reach a fixed point or at latest uh, when there are no boundary degrees of freedom left and we should get to a conformal boundary condition. So to make this intuition precise, there's actually a functional on boundary theories, the so-called Affleck Ludwig G function, which is proven to be monotonic along RG flows and stationary if and only if the RG flow is at a fixed point. So it's essentially analogous to the Zemlogikov C function with the exception that the G functional is uh, not known to be bounded below or not proven to be bounded below. Uh, in contrast with the C function, which definitely is bounded below. And the, the G functional, if it is bounded below, assuming it is, um, it, it's sort of not, it's, the bound is not uniform uh, among, uh, among bulk conformal field theories. Um, so the bound clearly depends on, on the bulk uh, conformal field theory that the boundary is a boundary of. But there are also no known counterexamples to its boundedness below um, in nice unitary CFT. And it's, it's strongly believed, I think, uh, to be true by, by conformal field theorists who have studied this question. Uh, I think Friedan and Konechny have been the most uh, 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 people who've studied this most intensively, and they provided a great deal of evidence for the hypothesis. So under this uh, friedan konechny hypothesis, uh, the G function must eventually stop decreasing, and then every boundary theory must eventually flow to a conformal boundary condition. So from here on, we're just going to assume this uh, uh, friedan konechny hypothesis of the boundedness below of the G functional. The logic of the derivations definitely depends implicitly on that. Um, oh, so may I, just a quick question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Does their hypothesis assume like a finiteness of C or? Yeah, I mean, it, it assumes things like, uh, you know, discrete, discrete uh, local operator spectrum uh -huh. and finiteness uh -huh. of central charge, unitarity okay. things, things, okay. all the you know, quote unquote, nice conditions of of CFT. Yeah, Thank you. that's right. Finally, why does the existence of a conformal boundary condition uh, necessarily imply the vanishing of the gravitational anomaly uh, C left minus C right? Well, this question has a very simple answer. It just follows from the unitarity and energy conservation in the presence of of the boundary. And um, so the necessity of C left minus C right for a consistent boundary condition can be proven in several different ways. The most straightforward is in uh, uh, Cardi's boundary state formalism. I see Professor Cardi is, is in the audience. So thank you for inventing this nice formalism, which makes this uh, point easy to prove. So I don't have to probably tell well, let me quickly review what a boundary state is. It, 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 it's a state of the CFT on the circle such that uh, the thermal path integral on the half line or the interval can be represented as uh, overlap in, uh, in boundary states in the cross-channel quantization. So if you consider a CFT on the interval of length L, take the thermal partition function at inverse temperature beta, uh, it's equivalent uh, uh, to the partition function on the Euclidean cylinder with circumference beta and length L. So exchanging the roles of space and Euclidean time, uh, we can reinterpret this as a matrix element of a of a Euclidean time propagation through time L of an initial and final state on the circle of radius beta over two pi uh, rather than an interval. So the initial and final states are boundary states because they started out before changing the channel as spatial boundaries. So uh, a, a boundary state always lives uh, more or less in the Hilbert space of states on the circle, not the interval. I say more or less because uh, a boundary state is not quite normalizable, but it's almost normalizable in the sense that acting with finite Euclidean time propagation for any finite uh, Euclidean time epsilon uh, is always always gives you a normalizable uh, state. So in the presence of a boundary, causality, energy conservation, and conformal invariance imply T equals uh, T tilde at the boundary. So the, the two chiral stress tensors are equal as operators at the boundary. And so at finite temperature beta, we can Fourier transform along the thermal circle, exchange the roles again of Euclidean time and space uh, 
and since we're Fourier transforming a boundary condition in the interval channel, this translates in the circle channel into a oops into a statement that certain linear combinations of Fourier modes of the stress tensor annihilate the boundary state B. So um, the form of the equation is L sub n minus L tilde sub n acting on the boundary state annihilates it for all integers n. Uh, and L and L tilde are the standard Virasoro generators. And this is this is one of the Cardi conditions defining a boundary state, the Virasoro Cardi condition, sometimes people will call it. Um, but given this condition, it's straightforward. It's just a, you know, a single line of algebra to show that C left minus C right vanishes for a non-zero boundary state. So in other words, there's no such thing as a boundary condition at all for a 2D CFT with unequal central charges. Again, yeah, imposing the, the conditions that, uh, some of the conditions that uh, uh, Yasunori uh, uh, mentioned, finite central charge and discrete spectrum and whatnot. Um, anyway, th there are a couple of other ways uh, to prove it, uh, but they're all they're all equivalent. So we've shown that uh, existence of a conformal boundary condition implies c left equals c right. So together with the friedan connection hypothesis and our construction of uh, boundary conditions from lattice regulators, uh, we've proven that existence of a lattice regulator implies the existence of a boundary condition implies C left equals C right. So we, we've proven the generalized nielsen ninomiya theorem. Uh, that's it. Uh, this result, I think, is interesting in its own right. Um, and uh, and yeah, l later on after after uh, its original appearance in, in Watanabe's thesis, uh, there were similar uh, results appeared, I think, years later by Xiao Gang Wen and others. Um, anyway, as we've uh, observed earlier, the tensor factorization of the Hilbert space is manifest if a lattice regulator exists. Uh, so we have a sort of diagram of logical implications like this. Lattice regulator implies the existence of a tensor factorization, which implies uh, the existence of a boundary also implies the about existence of a boundary condition and C left equals C right. Um, but we'd like to fit these conditions together into a single sequence of logical implications. So we'd like to uh, try to see if we can derive the existence of a boundary condition from the existence of a tensor factorization like so. Uh, existence of a lattice regulator implies the existence of a tensor factorization, which implies the existence of a boundary condition, which implies C left equals C right. We'd like to prove this middle link without assuming, without assuming this, uh, this first condition. Um, so let's, and, and uh, this can be done, but we'd like to do that so we can prove a strictly more general result. We'd like to uh, prove that the existence of a tensor factorization implies the existence of a boundary condition even if one doesn't necessarily have a, a lattice regulator. So we're going to now establish that, that middle link. So the basic idea is, is simple. Um, if the Hilbert space tensor factorizes, then there are two independent Hilbert spaces, uh, H sub A and H sub B, on which we can try to write individual Hamiltonians. And if each individual Hamiltonian is locally the same in each region as the Hamiltonian on the full spatial slice, then each Hamiltonian represents a CFT with boundary in the standard sense. So all we have to do is establish that we can in fact choose a Hamiltonian on each factor that's locally the same as the original Hamiltonian density. So the existence of such Hamiltonians is almost automatic if a tensor factorization exists. So the almost is the only bit where you have to do a, a little bit of work. Um, so let's remind ourselves what it means to have a tensor factorization. Uh, for any operators uh, on each individual factor, we have embeddings uh, of the individual factors into the, into the product. And for finite dimensional vector spaces or, or discrete uh, uh, locally finite dimensional uh, uh, Hilbert spaces, we have projections going the other way, given by taking the trace on one side and dividing by the dimension of the vector space. So we have projections, uh, A sigma goes to uh, curly A sub A, and likewise for B, just given by taking the trace on the, on the complementary factor and dividing by the dimension of the, of the complementary factor. 
so uh, with these projections, we would recover the original uh, operators on each factor if the Hilbert spaces were finite dimensional. But of course, they're not. And that's, that's why this whole subject of algebraic quantum field theory is, is uh, relevant or why, why people like to use it. Um, uh, the Hilbert spaces are infinite dimensional and the, the operator algebras on them are, are a bit more complicated. So we have to do a little bit more work. So we could try to ultraviolet regulate the theory so that the Hilbert spaces would be finite dimensional so that the trace is always well defined. But one doesn't want to structure the argument that way. I think it would be kind of cheating. So if you assume the existence of a, of a regulator uh, that renders the Hilbert spaces uh, finite, it's more or less equivalent to assuming a lattice regulator, which we don't want to do because we want to prove the, the more general statement. So instead, we can regulate the trace using the intrinsic data of the CFT itself, which is to say the renormalized CFT Hamiltonian H, uh, which we can use to define a heat kernel and an operator with finite trace in each factor that approximates the Hamiltonian and is local to all orders in the, in the high temperature expansion. So in other words, uh, we're going to define regulated single-sided Hamiltonians by the following recipe. So take the, uh, the heat kernel, on the entire Hilbert space using the global Hamiltonian H uh, at, at a temperature, uh, epsilon, uh, an inverse temperature epsilon, which we take to be low. In other words, a high temperature, one over epsilon. Um, that's step one. Step two is take the trace on the complementary factor. Uh, step three is take the log. Step four is multiplied by negative one over epsilon. And that gives you uh, a Hamiltonian on on uh, single-sided uh, Hamiltonian. So the regulated Hamiltonian has finite trace in the full Hilbert space and finite trace in each factor individually. It's also uh, an integral of a local density that approaches H in the limit epsilon goes to zero. Um, so in other words, the the um, the high temperature the 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 uh, the modular Hamiltonians uh, on the individual factors uh, derived from the, the high temperature heat kernel are, the, are local and they're the, the original Hamiltonians. Um, so uh, uh, they, they commute with local operators at a point up to other local operators at the same point, up to corrections that, that vanish exponentially in the limit epsilon goes to zero. And the, so the construction is, is essentially the same as uh, for, for uh, finite dimensional or discrete systems um, with the, uh, the effective dimension of the Hilbert spaces uh, played by, uh, by the von Neumann entropies of the reduced density matrices accessible with energy epsilon to the minus one. So, for any point in the interior of A or B, the regulated one-sided Hamiltonian is equal to the unregulated Hamiltonian plus corrections which, which vanish with epsilon and are local to all orders in epsilon. But the boundary, the boundary is different. Uh, at the boundary, operators can appear with negative powers of epsilon. So in particular, the Hamiltonian will contain a boundary cosmological constant scaling as epsilon to the minus one, actually with a log enhancement. Uh, but in general, other relevant boundary operators can also appear with coefficients scaling as epsilon to the delta minus one, where delta is the dimension of the, of the boundary operator. So in general, we can't say much in detail about uh, the limit, but again, we can appeal to this uh, friedan connection hypothesis because scaling epsilon to zero amounts to a boundary renormalization group flow in a CFT, so it uh, must go to a conformal point. And if indeed the G function is bounded below as it's conjectured to be. So again, under that hypothesis of boundedness below of the G functional, we recover a conformal field theory with conformal boundary condition as we take epsilon to zero. And by construction, uh, the boundary condition is unitary and energy conserving. And by the previous proof, uh, this means that the left and right moving central charges must be, uh, must be equal. So as we set out to do, uh, we've established the following set of implications. Uh, existence of a lattice regulator implies 
the existence of a tensor factorization, which implies the existence of a boundary condition, which implies C left equals C right. So we've shown formally there's no such thing as a tensor factorization of the Hilbert space into Hilbert spaces supported in complementary regions of a spacious slice, if the theory is gravitationally anomalous. Um, so now's the part of the talk where I generally get some, some questions. So principally, uh, isn't your proof too formal? Um, probably tensor factorizations in such theories are well-defined in some suitably modified sense. Can't we safely ignore this, this issue? And it doesn't seem to be the case. So the non-factorization of the Hilbert space really is physical uh, rather than merely formal. Uh, so in particular, so let me say what the physical meaning is, the physical implications. Uh, in a non-anomalous theory uh, where the Hilbert space can be tensor factorized, there's a basis of completely factorized states that span the Hilbert space. You know, th this is a statement that, you know, that's somewhat non-uniform in energy. These, none of the individual tensor factors is, uh, is finite energy, but that, that can be, uh, one can understand it in a kind of, uh, kind of approximate sense in, in finite energy. So in such states, but first, if you think about, if you think about the, uh, a, a literally factorized basis, it's obvious that there's, there's vanishing correlation in any such state between local operators in A and local operators in B. So it's actually very easy to construct uh, such, uh, such a basis uh, given, given a sufficiently large energy budget. So in, in non-chiral fermion theories, for instance, um, just take a, a single Majorana fermion, um, it's very easy to construct such states. They can be constructed <coughs> in several ways, but uh, there's some sort of squeezed state with no correlation between the two sides. But in a chiral fermion theory, there's, there's just no such construction. Uh, those factorized states don't seem to exist. So I, I can just say what they are. In, in non-chiral fermion theories, the easiest way to construct states like this is by giving a delta function supported mass term uh, to the Majorana fermion uh, that's supported at the at the entanglings or at you know the boundary between regions A and B, and by taking the uh, the coefficient of the mass term to infinity, uh, one can construct uh, uh, states with with arbitrarily strongly suppressed correlation between the two sides, uh, given uh, a certain amount of energy. So, in other words, given enough energy one can suppress all correlations between the two sides by an amount that uh, that depends uh, as a power law on the amount of energy that's that's available but there's there's no corresponding construction uh, for chiral fermion theories because there's no mass term available so also frequently asked uh, in the cardi calibrated uh, 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 formalism, uh, I can define uh, and compute the entanglement entropy in the continuum without reference to any regulator. Uh, and this formalism is almost equally good in gravitationally anomalous theories. Doesn't that falsify the no-go theorem? So surprisingly, no. Uh, so the cardi calabresa formalism is not quite universal uh, due to the way the UV regulator enters uh, through the definition, uh, enters the definition through the overall normalization of the twist operators. So uh, the trace of the nth power of the reduced density matrix has a normalization uh, with a particular power of the cutoff scale. Um, and it turns out that uh, uh, this description or uh, breaks down in, in its own terms when uh, the order of the, uh, of the uh, replicated surface is much greater than the log of the uh, cutoff times the infrared scale. So by expanding at large n, one can see that these uh, uh, the Rennies defined uh, by uh, by the uh, the uh, the Cardi Calabrese twist operators don't ever correspond to a consistent entanglement spectrum. So there's no n independent set of eigenvalues uh, such that the continuum Rennies uh, uh, are equal to uh, to the nth powers of some fixed. Uh, fixed spectrum of eigenvalues. So the continuum Rennies approximate the spectrum of a density 
uh, operator, but they don't fully define one. So the origin of this observation is by a paper by Cardi and Calabresa themselves from 2010, um, which, uh, which they interpreted in terms of the necessity of adding uh, subleading terms to the to the twist operators with uh, suppressed by higher powers of uh, of the UV cutoff, and then there was there was a beautiful uh, follow up sometime later by Omori and Tachikawa, showing that the UV completed Rennies can be systematically uh, used in a scaling limit to derive a boundary condition via a construction that's that's related to our own actually, with some some differences. So another question that gets asked is, what does the theorem apply about higher dimensions? So it actually was asked uh, by, by Yasunori. Um, so things can be learned by descent and dimensional reduction. So in particular, in six dimensions, uh, we find that any theory whose factorized anomaly coefficient is non-zero uh, can't have uh, any tensor factorization across, uh, across an entangling surface with non-zero signature class. So for instance, the, the two zero superconformal theory in six dimensions does not have any tensor factorization across an entangling surface such as CP2. Um, so this means among other things, there's, there's no possibility of a, uh, of a lattice regulator, for instance, for, for, uh, for the six dimensional uh, superconformal theory. And, and in general, there are, uh, the 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 uh, UV uh, the the um, infrared obstruction to to uh, well defined quantum information is also relevant in the, in the six dimensional superconformal theory. So um, yeah, so the, this theorem applies to actual conformal theories with nice holographic duals of whose existence we're we're quite confident in in two four and six dimensions. Um, so. Finally, I guess I'll, I'll touch on a, a number of other questions we don't fully understand the answers to, but I think um, a, a few comments can be made that might might help contextualize things. So quantum information theoretic quantities such as the entanglement entropy or the Rennie entropies are generally not observables. They're polynomial or otherwise nonlinear functionals of the density matrix, and they can't be implemented as observables in a single copy uh, of a quantum system. So nonlinear properties of the density matrix can, matrix can be associated to observables in a symmetric product of the underlying state in multiple replicas of the underlying system. The entanglement entropy and related quantities such as the relative entropy are associated with an infinitesimally small number of uh, extra replicas of the system, making them sort of almost observables, which is why they behave very much like ordinary observables in certain respects. They have the same locality and extensivity properties and so on as, as uh, ordinary uh, uh, local, local observables. Uh, by far the most studied application of quantum information theory to quantum field theory has been to compute relative entropy. Uh, unlike the entanglement entropy, which is a UV divergent quantity, uh, the relative entropy is a universal quantity in which the UV divergences cancel. Now, since the entanglement entropy is infinitesimally close to being an observable, it's not so surprising that it has certain locality properties and a universal renormalized version, which is the relative entropy. The higher Rennies, on the other hand, are not really local in any approximation. Uh, they don't have any definition with the same finiteness, locality, and universality properties and no canonical renormalized versions of themselves as the entanglement entropy has. Um, the relative entropy can be defined abstractly in operator algebraic terms in a way that makes the universality slightly overstated. But uh, in the case of higher Rennies, there's no such abstract definition with the same locality and universality properties. There can't be such a thing. The spectrum of the modular flow has been shown in explicit examples to be non-universal even after renormalization. A consequence of the lack of, uh, of an abstract and UV insensitive renormalized version of the higher Rennies is that there's sometimes no local version at all, such as when the anomaly is non-zero. This was explored concretely uh, in a, a paper 2018 by uh, Arias Cassini, uh, Huerta, and Pantello, uh, 
it's interesting that the one plus epsilon replica entropy does have a universal version, but the finite time modular flow, which is, is a superposition of infinite replica entropies doesn't. And it would be interesting to know where the non-universality first manifests, whether it's at order epsilon squared near one replica or whether it's only visible in the sort of large replica number limit. This question is particularly interesting uh, for the question of quantum information theory and, black hole inform and the black hole information paradox. Um, the most primitive version of the black hole information puzzle, uh, the version involving one plus epsilon replicas has now been solved conclusively. And it can be understood strictly at the level of, uh, of Euclidean quantum gravity without any consistency conditions uh, from a UV complete quantum gravity theory at all. If the broader quantum uh, black hole information problem could be solved similarly, it would mean that string theory and UV complete quantum gravity more generally would be irrelevant uh, to the black hole information puzzle. But of course, nobody really believes this, or maybe some people do, but not, I don't think most people. Most people believe that uh, UV consistency conditions must be relevant for a full solution to the black hole information problem. So the non-universality and consistency conditions uh, on any dual description must enter the problem somewhere between one plus epsilon replicas and infinity replicas. It would be good to know where. The anomaly has generally been the simplest and most robust non-trivial consistency condition in quantum field theory. And perhaps it'll play a role in uncovering at what level of refinement and for which quantum information theoretic quantities, the consistency conditions of quantum gravity may become relevant for the black hole information problem. Um, and then here are some things I didn't get a, a chance to talk about, um, which I will in questions if there's, if there's uh, uh, time. So uh, in conclusion, we've examined the self-consistency of the concept of entanglement in continuum field theory. Uh, in the gravitationally anomalous case in two dimensions, we've seen that the concept is simply ill-defined because the Hilbert space uh, doesn't factorize so as to respect locality. As a byproduct, uh, we've proved a generalized version of the nielsen ninamiya theorem, establishing a no-go principle for lattice regulators for all gravitationally anomalous CFT. The obstruction to factorization can be thought of as a quantum information theoretic refinement of the nielsen ninamiya theorem, establishing a no-go theorem for tensor factorizations. Boundary conditions play an important role. Uh, we, we've needed to assume Friedan and Konechny's hypothesis. Uh, the obstruction to factorization is physical, not merely formal. States with vanishing correlations between regions appear not to exist at all in chiral fermion theories and so forth. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sinyan. Uh, time for questions. Yeah. Um, I had a question about your very strong assumption that uh, um, that that any half space is going to flow to a conformal boundary condition. Um, I think that there are probably exceptions where you have a, a conformal field theory in the half space, but you have uh, a finite correlation length at the boundary, a kind of a mass gap at the, 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 the boundary. A theory, you know, a theory with a mass gap, a theory with a mass gap can't have uh, can't have a vanishing gravitational anomaly at all, though. Yeah, so that's you, true. You, I was just questioning your statement that you would always flow to a conformal boundary condition. I guess in that, I, by conformal, I don't mean conformal and non-trivial. So I, I'm including, I'm including trivial boundary conditions in what I would, what I would call conformal. So I guess in, in the sort of theory you're describing, the bulk would be gapped. No, the bulk would not be gapped. Oh, sorry. You mean you mean you, I, the I'm bulk sorry. The bulk would not be gapped, but the boundary would. I understand. I understand. Um, sorry. I so, know of examples like that. 
Um, so, so what happens to the flow in those examples? It's a good question. I, I think mean, that I think they're counter. I think they're probably counter examples to the Friedan Koneshny theorem, but I'm not sure. That's that's interesting. Okay, I would like to learn more about that. Um, okay, well, maybe if you email me, I, I'd be happy to talk about it a bit more. Okay, I will. Thank you. Uh, how did you conclude that this is not a UV problem? I, I may have just missed that. Uh, for example, you can consider some theory where a C, C left is not the same as C right. And then you can consider some other theory. Also C left is not the same as C right, of course. And then you can add the two theories in the Hamiltonian and then suddenly it should be fine. But it, for each, you cannot you know, uh, define entanglement entropy of certain regions, right? That's right. And, and, and then, that obstacle came not from the boundary, right? Near boundary is that's that's probably your claim that this is infrared uh, phenomenon. And that's right. Where, where, it, where in the proof did you see that? Where in, or, uh, where in the proof says that? Well, I mean, I mean, it's it's explicitly it's explicitly UV insensitive. I think. Um, the, I mean the. So, so let's see, what, what's the right thing to say? I mean, you're talking about two different things. One, one is putting together, one is adding a spectator theory to cancel the anomaly. Mm -hmm. And the other, I mean, that, that by itself is also a UV insensitive operation. That's just tensoring in a, tensoring in a spectator theory to cancel the anomaly. Um, so regulating Hamiltonian by epsilon and not playing any, any role? I mean, if I no. Uh, no, if you add, if you add, if you just add two, or tr try to add two decoupled. No, 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 no. In in, in a statement that uh, uh, before doing that, yeah, uh, uh, it's it's bad. Sorry. Oh, be before doing before before doing that, uh, the the concept doesn't make sense. So, right. So uh, let, let's forget about. Uh, Let's forget about patching the second CFT then. Uh, it's just, oh, okay. just keeping it in the first CFT. So, so I have a, yeah. And where do you show that this effect is not associated with the, with the entanglement sub? UV. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the simplest way to see it again is, is the absence of, the absence of states without long range correlations between the two sides. So that's that's just a, a statement that's independent of uh, any kind of any kind of short distance physics. So so the statement is that if you have a, a theory, let's say a, a non chiral a chiral fermion theory, excuse me, mm -hmm. then you can't you can't find even one state with vanishing correlations between operators on side A and operators on side B. Arbitrarily far away from the tangling surface. Yeah, so it's really not a, it's really not a UV thing. Ah, oh, okay. Great. More questions for Simeon? If not, let us thank Hasina again. <laughs>